Yeah, John's my friend in Scotland, so the, the home country. Love right. it. So, so for those of you who don't know me, my, my name is Kirk. I'm CEO of Foresight CFO. People call me the financial freedom guy. And my purpose is business owners gaining financial freedom. So th this event is open mm -hmm. mic, open video to interact as much as you want to. Feel free to use the raise hand feature because sometimes I don't catch all the body language on the, the posted stamp here. Uh, also feel free to, you know, if you have a question or thought or something you want to share, share it in the Q&A box or the chat box, right? Just whatever whatever you want to put your hands on and, and interact with, with folks. Feel free to do so, but but you know let let's have some fun. You know that, that this is, you know, if we're enjoying each other. Our minds are open. We're learning that kind of stuff, and I'm I'm truly truly delighted to introduce Joey Coleman. I mean, we were just talking about you know, 2018, 2019, something like that. Uh, first time I actually I read his book, but I saw him speak, and man, um, just took my life in the next step in the right direction. So, been been interacting with Joey ever since then. So when organizations like Whirlpool, Deloitte, Volkswagen Australia, Principal Financial, and Zappos, when they need to boost their employees' experience, they call Joey Coleman for assistance. He, he is the creator of the first 100 days, a system that is designed to dramatically increase your employee retention, and as a result, your bottom line. And I like bottom lines, right? Financial freedom. Thanks. Yeah, hallelujah. Right? And so... Um, Joey's a recognized expert in employee and customer experience design and is an award-winning speaker at both national and international conferences. He works with organizations ranging from all sizes, small startups that are fresh off the kitchen table to the large Fortune 500 companies with hundreds of mid-sized businesses in between. Prior to starting his business, Joey developed his narrative skills as a criminal defense trial attorney. Get that. So you got to be precision, right? And he he honed his communication and messaging skills at the White House and, and did things for the U.S. Secret Service and CIA that he can't talk about publicly. But since this is a closed meeting, feel free to ask about anything, right? So um, Joey's a Wall Street uh, Journal bestselling author, which is not easy to do. I get guys like 7,000 books an hour, and I'm exaggerating, but not by much. And his book, Never Lose an Employee Again, is being used as a playbook for creating remarkable experiences in organizations around the world. Today, he's excited to share strategies and techniques that will help you create the remarkable employee experience that will keep your people engaged, excited, and coming back for more. So please help me in welcoming Joey Coleman. Ah! Oh, Kirk, you're very kind. Thank you so much. Thanks to everybody for joining. So appreciate this opportunity. You know, one of the best things about doing these type of events is as an author, when you write a book, you don't always get the chance to connect with the people who are going to read the book. They go to the bookstore, they buy the audio book, they read the book, they dive into it. You don't always get the chance to interact with them, which is why when Kirk said, hey, Joey, could we put together kind of an author Q&A where people could ask questions, we could dive deeper into the research I did for the book, the outcomes uh, that we were able to discover from the book, the techniques and the tactics that we outline in the book, I immediately jumped at the at the opportunity, not only because it got me the chance to interact with all of you, but any chance I get to collaborate with my good friend Kirk and do these type of things is always a pleasure for me. What we thought we'd do if it works for all of you is a couple of things. Number one, maybe start by grounding our conversation in just a present day landscape map of the employer employee circumstance. I know many of you are employers. I know many of you, if not all of you are employees. And I thought maybe we just sound our uh, foundation, if you will, uh, with a little bit of a, a review of kind of what's currently going on as we record this at the end of August of 2023. I then thought I would present a framework, a methodology that I recommend you use when thinking about the employee journey. So from the first time somebody hears about a potential position opening in your organization, up until the point where there are raving fans singing your praises far and wide, how can we think strategically about that narrative uh, and about that journey? And so basically those two parts of the conversation, if I do my job right, 
take less than 15 minutes because I want the bulk of our conversation to not be a presentation, but rather Q and A and diving into any questions you have or anything that you think I might be able to help you with as it relates to employee experience. Uh, I always have a standing rule for Q and A and that is that any question is fair game. If you believe I have a perspective or an insight that might be useful to you or your situation, don't hesitate to ask. Uh, two things real quickly before we get started. If you want to turn on your camera, that makes it a lot more exciting for me. You don't have to. Don't worry if you're in the car, driving around, doing errands, you're having your lunch. No pressure. Brian's taking a drink right now. It's fabulous. I'm not going to call everybody out for what they're doing. I just wanted to do that one because it'd make it exciting. But if you want to turn on your cameras, that makes it fun so we can all connect. But again, not required. Second thing I want to do is explain this because Kirk asked me, he's like, is that a fake background, Joey, or is that real? This is actually real. Uh, so what this is, is I'm at my parents' house visiting with my wife and kids. We're having a little uh, summer fun and games uh, here at the end of summer, squeezing out the last few minutes we can. And my ancestors, so this is great, 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 great type grandparents, came to the United States from Ireland. And they were farmers and they arrived in Iowa before Iowa was even a state. And they found themselves along this river and there were some caves in the near the river and winter was coming. And uh, while they were farmers and definitely wanted to build houses, they were like, we're not gonna be able to have these houses built in time before the snow starts flying. So they stayed in the caves over the course of the winter. And then in the spring, when the cavalry arrived to build the fort that would become Fort Dodge, Iowa, they found these Irish farmers there, the Coleman's. And the Coleman district became the first, if you will, little area in this community that was built, you know, over 150 years ago at this point. And when they built the first school, it was called the Coleman School. Cool. And they decided to engrave this stone and hang it above the door. And when they were tearing down the school, my dad went to him and said, hey, is there any way we could get the stone? Can I buy the stone? That kind of thing. And so the stone kind of became a cornerstone or a hearthstone rather uh, in the fireplace in the house. So it is real. It's not an ego thing. It's just I happen to be on the road filming and this was a fun backdrop. So Segwaying from that discussion, which is kind of an interesting discussion because my first employer was my dad. I actually worked in his law firm as a kid, my first job being in sixth grade making copies. And I continued to work with him up until I became a criminal defense lawyer. Uh, I thought we would start our conversation by talking about the landscape of employees today and employee-employer relations. So for those of you that have your camera on, if you could just wave your hand in front of the camera. And for those of you that are listening in but don't have your camera on and just want to put it in the chat, go ahead and either wave your hand or put in the chat. If you've had some challenges with employees in the last year, in 2023, John is waving both hands. Tom's waving hands. hands. Kirk, I'm waving my hands. Kirk's waving hands. Uh, it's a really tumultuous time as it relates to employees and employee experience. But let's break that down into some research. We have some anecdotal data, our own personal experience of what a tumultuous time it is in employer-employee relations. But let's dive into the data and what the data shows us. And the data shows us a couple things. Number one, when you hire a new employee, this is regardless of position, regardless of industry. When you hire a new employee, only 60% of those folks that you hire will still be there a year later. 40% of the people you hire will not make the one year anniversary. 40%. I don't know about you all, but to me, that number is staggering. Oh my gosh, 40% of the people that we work to recruit, that we work to train, that we're trying to get on board, we have a vision of they're going to be with us for years to come, won't even make the one year anniversary. In fact, 22% of those people won't make the 100-day anniversary. They will leave before they've been there for three months. This isn't surprising in many ways because the research also shows that 74% of employees will decide whether or not they stay for the first month based on what happens the first day. Their first day on the job, the impression they have, those first impressions, those feelings, when they show up for their first day on the job, if that day isn't remarkable, isn't incredible, they're not going to even stay for a month. All right. 
So we understand that people are leaving faster than at any other time in human history. Additionally, we know that people are quitting more today than at any other time in human history. Department of Labor measures how many people are quitting. And what's interesting is when we look at the number of people that have quit in 2018, 2019, 2020, 21, 22, 23, each year, more people have quit working than the previous year. What does that tell us? Well, the idea that many of us, or at least our parents had of, hey, you go to work for somebody and you stay there for 30 years and you get the gold watch and you retire with the pension, those days are gone. It is much more of a revolving door. It is a much more of a transient conversation. Employees are leaving. Two more crazy statistics. Number one, Kirk mentioned the bottom line. When an employee leaves and we have to replace that employee, the cost of replacing that employee is somewhere between 100 and 300% of the annual salary of the position we're trying to fill. So you've got a $50,000 a year job, that person leaves and you want to fill it with another person, it's going to cost you somewhere between $50,000 and $150,000 to fill that position. Now, some of you are like, Joey, fake news, this math, it doesn't add up, I don't understand. Well, let me break it down for you. You've got the cost of posting that position and recruiting and listing on Indeed or LinkedIn or wherever you're doing it. You have the time that your team is going to spend reviewing resumes, checking out videos, doing background checks, going through interviews. You then make the hire. Then you have the back and forth time on negotiation. All of these hours that are clicking by for your team, for your staff, for the people doing the interview, for you as the leader are hours that we're often not accounting at our effectable hourly billable rate to figure out the total impact. Then when this new person starts their job, are they gonna be super productive and contributing to your bottom line on day one? Absolutely not. They need time to get up to speed to figure things out. When we break down the total cost of this, it's somewhere between 100 and 300% of the annual salary to go from an empty spot to a refilled spot. Okay, geez, Joey, you're, you're hitting us with these statistics right out of the box here. This doesn't sound good. This doesn't sound fun. Well, let me give you one more to just kind of sharpen our focus for our conversation today. And that is that the most recent research shows that 65% of current employees are considering leaving their position in the next year. 65%. So my question to all of you is which 65% of your team are you okay not having on your team in Q1 of next year? Because the research shows they're either thinking about leaving or they're gonna leave. This is a big problem. It's a problem that has been growing in its size, scale, and reach for decades. And it is a problem that is not going away. It's not that, oh, once they stop getting COVID checks, they're going to come back to work. Once we sort out this work from home, work remote thing, it's all going to even out. No, we actually have fewer workers in the workforce today than we have in past years. That number is going down each year. Yes, I understand that technology and AI and automation tech activities are allowing us to do more with fewer people, but we have this gap where we are going to be fighting for the top talent over the next 20 years, even more than we fought for the top talent in the last 20 years. Oh my goodness, Joey, it's lunchtime. I came to this thing thinking I'd learn something. I'd be excited. I'd be feeling good. You're just hitting me with the negative news. All right, let's shift the conversation. What can we do to address this? Well, the good news is most employers aren't paying attention to this. Most leaders aren't paying attention to this. Yeah, they're having some meetings here and there. They might be picking up a book every once in a while, trying to figure out, oh, you'll go into a talk. Oh, what can we do? I know we'll pay our people more. I know we'll get foosball tables in. That'll make it better. I've got an even better idea. Let's do a $500 bonus to any employee who re refers a new hire that comes and work for us. Then this will solve all of our problems. Friends, those are little sprinkled efforts that yes, may make things better, but not in any appreciable or sustainable way. 
what we need to do is shift our thinking about the entire employee journey. I believe there are eight phases to the employee journey. And with your permission, I'd love to give you a quick overview of each one. And then as we dive into the Q&A, we can dive more specifically into whichever ones are interesting to you. The first phase is the assess phase. This is when a prospective employee is trying to decide whether or not they want to come work for you. They're checking out your job description or your position posting. They're going on to LinkedIn to see who they know might have worked with your organization or might still work at your organization so they can get the inside scoop. They're going to the About Us page on your website, the hiring page, the careers page. They're trying to get a feel for who you are. They're also submitting their resume and their application. They're going through your interview process. They're getting that first real taste of who you are as an employer. And in the assess phase, the secret is to give that prospective employee as close of an experience of what it will be like to be a full-time employee as possible. We then come to the second phase, the accept phase. The accept phase has two component parts. The organization identifies who it is that they want to make a job offer to, and they extend that offer. And if we're lucky, that desired candidate accepts the offer. They transition from being a prospective employee to being an actual employee by accepting our offer. We then come to phase three, the affirm phase. Now, by a show of hands, raise your hand and wave them in the camera or jump them into the chat and say yes, if you've heard the phrase buyer's remorse. Okay, I see some hands waving, buyer's remorse. Yeah, go ahead and drop in the chat. Yes, Joey, I've heard of buyer's remorse if you're in the chat. Here's the thing. We've all heard of this phrase, buyer's remorse, but I'd like to potentially introduce you to a new concept, which is new hire's remorse. It is the scientifically proven experience that a newly hired employee has immediately after they decide to join our organization. When they sign on the dotted line, they accept the job offer, their brain floods with dopamine. They feel joy, euphoria, and excitement. This is the organization that's gonna be the answer to my prayers. This is where I'm gonna be able to build my career. I'm gonna make more money, have more responsibility, more opportunity, more benefits, perks. We're feeling good. But it almost immediately is that dopamine that had flooded the brain starts to recede. Those feelings of joy, euphoria, and excitement are replaced by feelings of fear and doubt and uncertainty. What if this job isn't as great as it was cracked up to be? You know, now that I think about it, maybe I could have negotiated more. We went back and forth a couple of times on my benefits package and my salary, but I bet if I would have stuck with it, I might've gotten a better deal. You know, at this time that I was interviewing with the company that I accepted the job offer, I also was interviewing with a couple other companies and I hadn't heard back from them. Uh, should I have waited in case I got a better deal from one of them? What if I would have been able to get them to bid against themselves? I might've gotten an even better deal. All of these thoughts these feelings, these concerns that are happening create a scenario where the newly hired employee begins to doubt the decision they just made. Our job as an employer is to jump in and affirm their choice. But what do most employers do in that time period between when they accept the job and when they show up for their first day? Nothing. Exactly, John. You're right. Nothing. There's no communication other than, hey, be there Tuesday at 9 a.m. in two weeks when we start. There's no handholding. There's no affirming. There's no making sure that we reinforce the choice they made. We then come to uh -huh. phase four the activate phase. The activate phase is that first day on the job. It's not the first day of the 100 days. By the way, that first day of the 100 days is when they accept the job offer that this is their first day at work. And for some of them, if you've got an employee who accepts the job offer and doesn't start till two weeks later, if it's an executive, it might be a month later, two months later, that affirm stage is huge. And now they show up for the first day and what normally happens? Well, it's anything but remarkable. Huh. You know, they come in, they tell the receptionist they're there. They wait in the lobby. Eventually, someone comes and takes them to the boardroom, right? And they say, oh, come into this conference room here. Um, we've got some paperwork we need you to fill out. We're going to need to know which insurance plan you want to opt into, how much we should withhold on your taxes. Fill out this paperwork. Fill out this. Pa you know, then we also have some videos we'd like you to watch about sexual harassment. These videos were filmed in the 70s. No one's watched them since then. They were horrible at that time, but we're still showing them to you today. Go ahead and watch this video 
window. We'll leave you alone in the room, which doesn't feel creepy or weird at all. And we'll be back around lunchtime to pick you up and take you to lunch. Oh, when you come to lunch, we're actually going to take you to lunch with a couple of people on your team who know nothing about you, but they've all worked together for years. So they're going to sit in a table and talk to each other in a way that you can't break into the conversation and you can just kind of sit there. Then after lunch, we'll bring you back to the conference room again to do some more paperwork and we'd send you to your desk, but actually IT forgot to order your computer and we don't have your phone. We don't have business cards for you. So, you know, now that I think about it, we don't have a lot for you to do this afternoon. So uh, why don't you just go ahead and head home and we'll see you tomorrow. Now, here's the crazy thing. As I'm telling that story, I'm seeing a lot of faces smile and kind of laugh yeah. and kind of join in. And it's probably because you're like, how did Joey know where I work? Because I had that experience at a job. And it's like, no, the reason I know that is because this is all too common for an experience of the first day. The secret on the first day is we got to have the words of the immortal country music legend, Bonnie Raitt, running in our head. We got to give them something to talk about. Because we know every employee, when they get home from that first day on the job, to their spouse, their significant other, their parents, their kids, their roommate, whoever it is, the first question that loved one is going to ask is, how was your day? How was it? Because our loved ones know when we're starting a new job. The question is, are you thinking strategically about how you want that new hire to answer that question that we know they're going to be asked? Or are we just leaving it to chance? We then come to phase five, the acclimate phase. This is where the employee gets used to your way of doing business. The acclimate phase starts on their second day at work and runs for weeks, even months, depending on the position. How long is it going to take them for, to, to get used to your cadence of communication, the way you operate, their role, the responsibilities, the various relationships they have, the requirements of the position? Are you effectively holding their hand or are you giving them a day or two of orientation and then pushing them into the deep end of the pool and saying, you'll just kind of figure it out as you go? Or even worse, are we having HR manage their first day, but their second day is managed by their manager? who, by the way, has never had any training in how to manage or onboard a new employee and now is responsible for managing this employee when they probably got promoted to be a manager because they were good at doing the tactical job, not managing the people who have the job. Tom smiling, going, oh, I might've seen this in IT once or twice, right? This happens all the time in every industry, in every role, in every position. We've got to help hold their hands so they can acclimate to this new position they have. We then come to phase six, the accomplish phase. This is when the employee achieves the goal they had when they originally decided to accept the job offer. See, every employee has a vision of where they want their career to go. And they have a vision of what place this job, this role, your company plays in their journey. The question is, do we know what their vision is? Are we tracking their progress towards that vision? Are we paying attention and celebrating with them when they hit the necessary milestones to achieve their goals? We have our goals that we want them to accomplish, but are we paying attention also to their goals and what they're trying to achieve and do? We then come to phase seven, the adopt phase. This is when an employee becomes loyal to us and only us. They're bought in, they're part of the culture, they're committed. These are the employees that we all want but frankly, the employees we often take for granted, the ones who are committed, who are loyal, who are there, and we're like, well, of course they're there. They've always been there until one day they're not. And the knowledge drain when they leave and the culture drain when they leave can be decimating to an organization. And if you get a couple of adopters to quit in the same two or three month period, you begin a death spiral culturally and in terms of your employee morale and in terms of your employee retention. Last but not least, we come to the advocate phase. This is when the employee becomes a raving fan, singing your praises far and wide. They're going on Glassdoor and writing reviews. They're bringing their best friends to come work at the company. Anyone they've ever worked with who's an absolute rock star, they want to have come join the company. Even when they leave the company, they still continue to advocate for us. Lots of business leaders I talk to will tell me, oh, Joey, We've got great advocates. We've got a company full of advocates. I'm like, awesome. Here's a little question to test that belief, to see if it's true or not. 
the last time you had an open position that you were advertising for in your organization, what percentage of the candidates that you received and kind of brought into the candidate pool and then interviewed were direct referrals from existing employees or former employees? You might be surprised, friends. It gets real quiet as people go, well, I, and guess what? You don't actually have advocates. That's how you can test if you have advocates. If you're seeing double digit percentage of candidates being referred from your existing team members, your alumni team members, you know that you've built something special that is worth advocating for. So those are the eight phases of the employee journey. I know there's a lot in there. And now we can dive into whichever phases you think are most interesting. If there's any questions for everyone, like I said, we wanted to have this kind of grounding conversation about why it's important and what can we do about it, and then open it up to any questions you all had. So don't hesitate to use the reaction of raising your hand, or if your camera's on and you physically want to raise your hand, or if you want to drop it into the chat, happy to dive into any questions you might have. Yeah, to, to, to warm things up, I do, I do have a question from the chat, Joey, so I'm going to throw this one out here. But uh, you guys feel free to come off uh, mute and um, you know jump in, but there's probably something that's current that's worth you know collaborating on. You got you got the mind share here. So um, here's here's a question. Um, what are, Joey, what are some surprising insights you discovered about the factors that contribute to employee loyalty and retention? Yeah, great question. So I think if you were to ask most leaders when an employee leaves, why did that employee leave? The typical response you get is, well, they got more money at the other place. The other place gave them better benefits, a, a better package. And that is true, but not for as many people as you think. Here's the thing. Most of the research that has been done on why employees leave is based on a sample set of 200 to 500 respondents. That's kind of standard across all industries. In doing the research for Never Lose an Employee Again, we found a study done by the Work Institute that surveyed 234,000 exiting employees. So this was a magnitude greater than most surveys. And what they found is indeed, there are employees that leave for a better package, more money, higher salary. It's 9%. That is certainly significant and worth paying attention to. And you've got to pay your employees a wage that is designed to take care of them, keep them engaged, be competitive in the marketplace, et cetera. But I was more interested in the 91% that left for reasons other than money because what could we do to move the dial there? That same research found that 23% of employees who leave, so about two and a half times the number of people that leave for money left for a single reason. And that reason is they didn't see a clear career path forward at the organization where they were working. And I see some heads nodding and I see some people chiming in. And the reality here is, if we don't have a clear understanding of our path as an employee, and we don't believe our employer cares about our path forward, we will go find a path somewhere else. So we've got to think more strategically about that. You had asked, uh, Tom, what was phase six? Phase six is the acclimate phase, right? This is where they're getting used to your way of doing business, or excuse me, the accomplish phase. So we've got acclimate is phase five. Phase six is accomplish, right? Where they achieve that goal they had when they originally started to do business and decided to like become part of your team. Yeah. Hey, hey. So go ahead, Kirk. I'm just, okay. Well, go ahead or you want me, want me to wait? Well, I was going to say, I'm happy to give an example because now that I see some heads nodding and people going, okay, a path forward, great. But how do I do that, Joey? Like, I understand I want to do this and it's important to prevent it. Let me give you a quick case study from the book. Okay. This comes from a company called Well-Oiled Operations. Okay. They've got the name that kind of manifests the design of this case study. Well-Oiled Operations has about 15 employees. And their CEO, Stacey Tushel, every year has a meeting with the whole team, the annual meeting, where she presents the three-year vision for the company. Now, what's interesting, I see a lot of heads nodding, and I'm presuming people in the chat as well. This happens at a lot of companies. We kind of have an annual vision setting, like here's where we're going, this is what we're gonna do. But what the team at Well-Oiled Operations and Stacy do differently 
is very unique. And it's something that every one of you could do with about an hour's worth of effort. And that is when they present the vision of where they're going, they also present the future org chart. See, most organizations have an organizational chart that details the various roles. They share the future org chart, which is what the org chart will look like in three years. Many of those positions aren't filled. Many of those positions will require people to be hired, to be promoted, to switch different divisions. By showing them visually, here is a path forward. It also allows the employee to assuage concerns they have, not only about the firm's growth and their position in the firm's growth, but about people that are ahead of them on the ladder. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say I'm working with Tom and Tom's my boss and I've come in and I've now you know, joined Tom's team. Tom has been leading this team for two years. The person that led the team before Tom led it for 15. The person who led it before that person led it for 15. The person who led it before that person led it for 15. I know this because I've been part of the company. I've watched the hierarchy. I've heard the stories. So Tom's been in the role for two years. I'm right underneath Tom. Mm -hmm. I'm doing the math going, it's 13 years before Tom's going to move to another position and I might be able to have Tom's role. I don't want to wait 13 years. So what do I do? I start looking outside of the organization for a new role. I don't even look within the organization. I go, gosh, well, if they don't see my value here and I'm not going to be able to be promoted for another 13 years, I better go look somewhere else. A huge percentage of employees don't even know they have other options within your organization, other divisions, other departments. Having a future org chart helps them visually see it. Last thing I'll say about the future org chart that Stacy does, which I think is brilliant. After she presents the org chart, she says, and by the way, if you see a role or a position on here that isn't filled, that you think is a position you'd like to fill in the future, come talk to me about it now so we can start to position you, train you, make sure you have the understanding, the skill set, the knowledge to be able to fill this role when we're ready to fill it. Imagine this, you've got an employee who's interested in photography and in your future org chart, you have an e-commerce division where you're going to start selling products and you know you're going to need product photos. You don't need product photos today. You don't even have the product you're going to sell, but you know you're going to need them in the future. You've got a team member now, Douglas, who says, oh, I'm interested in photography. So you say, hey, Douglas, great. Didn't realize you had that interest. You might like to be a director of photography for our e-commerce store that we're going to need in three years. Let's start getting you involved in some photography now. Can you take photos, headshots of the whole team? Maybe you can shoot our company picnic. Can you get some candidates when we're all hanging out in a brainstorming session so we can put those photos on the website? Is there a photography class you want to take? Let's go ahead and let that be a reimbursable course that you can take. Now, Douglas is saying, my employer cares about me. My employer is willing to invest in me. And you, as the employer, are getting the chance to figure out is maybe Douglas a better photographer than a customer service rep or a member of the accounting department or wherever they're operating? This type of insight not only shares our shows our employees that they matter, but it allows us to build our bench. As you can tell, I've got some strong feelings about this stuff. Or sorry for jumping in and ranting, but Kirk, I think you had another question or another observation. Yeah, did, you know, I'm, th I'm thinking about some of the things that you're putting down, like like um, you know. For the employees to be clear on, you know, what are their goals, objective, vision for the role, vision for their life? Well, like, what do they really want out of this experience on, you know, this human experience in life? And I'm thinking, sure, sure the um, more experienced top level employees probably have some thoughts about where they want to end up because that's the role. But most people are not, are not, you know, the CEO of the business thinking on that level. Um, I, I kind of think that most people don't really know what they want, don't really know, you know where are they best aligned, that kind of thing. Um, and, and connecting the dots here, so you got a future org chart that shows, hey, in, over the next couple of years, here's you know the, the the bigger possibility. Then you um, career path, basically a career path between the future org chart and the person. So how do you help the person? What what's a practical way to help the person gain some clarity about what? Because sometimes people get to the goal and they're like, man, this is more empty than right. It got everything I asked for, and look at me, I'm not liking it. So how do you help people really figure out what's 
what help them pick out their vision for themselves before you align it to what they do in the business. Kirk, I think this is a really interesting question, you know, that in many ways has a philosophical bent. Like as humans, how do we decide what matters to us and decide where to put our time and attention and effort? And the practical reality is humans have been thinking about this and talking about this for over, you know, um, for millennia, for thousands of years. Like what is the goal? What's interesting is we've reached a time in the evolution of work where employers are increasingly being called to help their employees figure that out. You know, it used to be we'd have lots of employers and, you know, I, I've worked for these employers and, you know, been interacting with these employers who are like, look, I pay you to come to work and do your job. It's your job to figure out if you want a promotion. It's your job to figure out what your career path is, how you're going to make more money. Oh, you're expecting a kid. You're going to need more money. Great. You need to figure out how to do that. Not come to me and just say, I'm about to, you know, have a baby. We, I need a $20,000 a year raise. Yeah. What we do have the opportunity to do is to work to educate our folks as to the paths available to them within our organization and potentially the paths available to them outside our organization. So let me tackle those one at a time because that second one is gonna maybe make some folks a little anxious. Paths inside of our organization, when you bring a new hire on, lots of times in an interview, we'll have people ask that what I think is kind of a lazy question. Where do you see yourself in three years? And it's usually a ridiculous question because the answer is ridiculous. And as the person asking the question, we don't really know what to do with their answer. Even if they do give us a good, we're like, oh, am I supposed to write that down or pay attention to it or check back in two years and see how your progress is going? What if we started asking that question after the interview? What if we asked that as part of our acclimate phase or after they'd been on the job for a month? We went to them and we said, hey, you've been here for a month. What's working? What's not working? Now that you have a little bit more of a lay of the land, what are the positions that are most interesting to you? Let me show you the pathway. I was talking with a client the other day and they said when they come in, after they've spent a month with one of their kind of intake reps, which is kind of their base level role position that they're hiring for, they sit down with the new employee and they say, great, so here's the thing. There are three paths forward that are the most common paths. You stay an intake rep for years to come. And here's what the salary step ups look like and the responsibility step looks like. We have this other path that is intake manager where you become responsible for managing the intake team. Then we have this separate track that is kind of for sales. So you get so excited about the impact or the intake that you start getting excited about, well, let me be further downstream or upstream rather. Let me be on the marketing team, the sales team. These are the three most common paths. And they break down the roles, the responsibilities, the salary, what it's going to be. And they say, you don't have to decide today. But what we found is folks that make a decision between day 30 and day 60, achieve those roles and those goals faster. So in the next month, as you're going through your job, and we're going to have some sit down conversations about this, let's figure out which track we want to get you on. They don't ask them to choose the track on day one because the employee doesn't know anything on day one. And they don't ask them to make a decision in the meeting where they present the tracks because the employee hasn't had time to think about the tracks. They work with them over the course of about 30 to 60 days to say, let's go into it with the understanding that we can jump on a different track at any time in the future. But let me help you to start thinking strategically about this. Last point I'll make on this before we go to Brian's question is, it may be that the track for them to consider is not with your organization. There's a case study in the book uh, in the adopt phase where I interviewed the CEO of an advertising agency called Church and State. They're based in Canada and Ron Tights the CEO. And what's interesting about Ron is he believes that his job as the leader of his agency is to foster and grow talented folks in the advertising agency world whether they're working for him or working for someone else. So when everybody comes in, he says, look, my job is to help you grow your career. So let's figure out what you want. Let's figure out if you like this career. If you're ever thinking about leaving, my only request is that you'll come to me, not so I can present a counter offer, but so that I can advise you on whether I think it's a good choice or not. He had one employee come to him and he's like, I've been offered the position of creative director at this other agency. 
Ron said, you shouldn't be talking to me right now. You should be calling me from that agency because that's what's best for your career and you're never gonna be creative director here. And so I support you going over there to do something. He had another employee come in and say, I've been offered this position to be a director at this other firm. He said, oh my gosh, don't go there. I know those guys. They're miserable. They churn and burn. They're gonna. They're they're not gonna deliver on all the things they promised. I didn't know that you had a desire to be a director. We've never talked about that. If you're willing to give me the next six to twelve months, we'll put in place all the things to help you get the skill set where we could promote you to a director. You're not ready to be promoted to a director. That's the other thing. You're gonna go over to this other company. They think you're ready. I'm telling you, you're not ready yet. Yeah. And you're gonna go over there and you're gonna get fired. Then you're not gonna know what to do. Let me help build your career here. So it's not just about building people's careers within your organization. It's about thinking strategically outside of your organization. Let's go to Brian. And then Sam has a question in the chat. Brian. Hey, Joey. Thanks for your time today. That's oh, my um, pleasure. First question is a softball for you. Are you in Fort Dodge, Iowa today? I am in Fort Dodge, Iowa today. You yeah. are correct. Yeah, I used, to, I used to visit my grandma in Dayton, Iowa. Which oh, I love great. it. You're just down the road. Yeah. I love small, it. What a small, small world. world. Yeah. Um, just want to make a, I have a question, but first I want to make a comment about a couple of comments, actually. The talking to employees about their career path, to me, that really sounds like a big difference between managing and leading. Yes. It's not about managing people, it's about leading them where they want to go. And so that's most, I think most businesses don't have leaders, they have managers. So I think that's a huge distinction there as far as that path forward. Brian, and I the, if I may, I'll, I'll one up that statement. I've yet to meet a human being who woke up in the morning and said, oh, can't wait to be managed today. <laughs> Humans don't want to be managed. And yet we have all these managers. I, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. There is a big difference between managing to a task and leading to a vision. Now, leading can still have tasks. It can still have requirements and responsibilities, but it's very different when we are thinking about this activity instead of this activity, which is usually managing. Yeah, I agree. And then I think the case study that you mentioned is, is brilliant about presenting the future org chart with the three-year vision. The future org chart is one of, the, one of our tools that we use at Foresight. And I'd never thought of it being presented that way. And I think that combination would be really powerful as far as combining the future org chart with where we're going and potential career paths. Um, anyway, and then my question for you is, any insight on how to set up referral network from the employees so that they do um, bring people in? Yeah, a couple things. Uh, I'll give you a high level and then we can dive deep into any of them if you like. Number one, most employees aren't even aware that there are open positions that the organization is looking to hire. Yeah. I know that might sound shocking and stunning to you, but that's what the research shows. So the first thing you can do if you want to have a good employee referral program is make sure your employees know you're hiring and for what roles and for what type of person. The best in class companies in the world on this are regularly having meetings, not only with the people in that type of team, but who have a vision of that geography. What do I mean by that? So let's say there's an example in the book of something that Google did. Google was looking to hire more salespeople in the Chicago area. So they did two things. They went to all of their salespeople globally and said, we're looking to hire more salespeople in Chicago. They then went to every employee in Chicago, whether they were in sales or not, and said, we're looking to hire people in Chicago to do sales. So they came at it from both angles to make sure everybody was aware. Secondly, if you're going to ask an employee to put their name and reputation on the line by saying you should come work here, it's got to be worth it for them. So many referral programs are based around, if you refer a candidate, we'll give you $50. And if that candidate is hired and works for us for three months, we'll give you $500. So what you're telling your employees is their reputation is worth $550. If everything goes beautifully well. And if they've already worked for you, they know that everything isn't always going to go beautifully well. So what you've really told them is their reputation is worth $50. And if we roll the dice and get lucky, $550. Yeah. 
And then people go, why aren't any of our people making referrals? Because it's not in their best interest, financially or reputationally. So if you are going to do incentives, make sure the incentives are aligned with the commensurate value to the organization for the type of role being referred. You want to get someone's attention? Hey, the referral bonus, if it's money, is a month of that position's salary. Oh, so let me get this right. If I refer a CFO candidate that gets hired, I get a month of the CFO's salary? Yes. Now you've got everybody's attention because people are like, this is epic. And they're willing to reach deeper into their network. Last thing I'll say about referral programs is it's not all about the Benjamins. Forgive their reference to the US dollar, right? But often when you're doing a referral bonus for an employee, it's better to do something that isn't money. There's some excellent research on this out of the University of West Virginia. And what they found is when an employee is given, for example, $1,000 in cash, they most often will take that money and use it to pay down debt or pay for necessities. They don't do a $1,000 shopping spree. They don't buy something special for themselves. Whereas if you give them the $1,000 e-bike, if you give them the $1,000, you know, stay at the hotel with, you know, dinner and the suite and do, do, do. If you give them the experience instead of giving the money, they will actually do or use the experience and associate that positive feeling with you and making a referral instead of associating, hey, I made a referral. I put my reputation on the line and I paid down some debt as a result. It's a different uh, interaction. Yeah. Want to go to Sam's question? Yeah, Sam's question. Thanks for that question, Brian. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Um, Sam's question, how often should the decision maker talk to employees about their career path? Sam, feel free to hop off of mute if you would. When you say the decision maker, do you mean the decision maker about whether or not they will move forward on that career path? Or who yeah. are you referring to when you so, say decision maker? Yeah, so so Joey here here the decision maker can be uh, the CEO of the company or uh, anybody in the board of directors, any anyone who is the decision maker who does the decision for uh, the company and the hire and everything. How often uh, should they speak to the employee, or he or she should speak to the employee if it's a single decision maker? So what's interesting, Sam, is I'll. And, and maybe you've got a very specific example in case, but often as an organization grows, the person who makes the decision on whether someone gets promoted or not, or gets a position or not, quickly goes away from being part of the CEO's job or part of the board of directors. So it, it usually starts to move its way down the line. When you're a startup, yeah, I, hey, I'm the founder. Anybody who's getting hired, I'm the one saying whether we're hiring them or not, I'm looking at the numbers. But once you get to the point where you've got 15 or 20 people, you start to move away from that being the sole decision of a single decision maker. And it becomes more a direct manager's job or maybe a division head's job. I think those folks should absolutely be having those conversations with the team members at least once every six months. For the person who is the direct manager, I think even closer to every three months. Now, some of you are like, Joey, that sounds like a lot of career pathing conversations. Well, this isn't a conversation every three months with your direct report saying, so where do you see yourself in three years? How's this career going? No, it's a, hey, let's stop and review. You told me that your goal was next year to be in this position. Let's look at your performance for the last three months. You're on track. You're doing great. Keep up the great work. Or what is more often the case, you are doing really well on these three criteria, but in this area, you're falling behind and we're not going to be able to have you get that position. Even if someone else is making the decision, not just me, I'm telling you right now, you're not putting up the numbers we need in this criteria. So let's double down in the next quarter. I'll help you. I'll support you, Brian. I'll lead you. I'll do things. I'll, I'll find the resources so that we can have you hitting on those cylinders and creating that success so that when it comes time, 
it's a fait accompli. The decision's already been made. I imagine looking around the, the table here and kind of looking around at all the folks I see on the screen, there've been points in your career when you've got a promotion that was well-deserved because you'd done all the things and more. There are times where you thought you'd done all the things and they were like, mm, actually there's this other thing that maybe we never told you about, but is also part of our career criteria. And you're like, why didn't you tell me that was a thing? Why didn't you tell me that was important? Or where you've gone in to do the, you know, have the conversation about a raise or a promotion. And it's like, yeah, here's a bunch of areas where it didn't fall start. This is the problem I have with doing annual reviews. Yes, no, way too late. It's way too late. An annual review, oh my God. Like, I can't remember the thing I did wrong in month two when you're telling me about it in month 12. You got to yeah. tell me about it in month two. And we got to be working in month two to not make the mistake again in month three. And in month four, to not only not make the mistake, but to be pushing forward to take consideration for the mistake and the misstep in month two. Yeah, It should always be about moving forward. And this is where we need to think more holistically about the training and the support that we give to our managers, our mid-level leaders who lots of times are just like, I'm overworked and underpaid. We see this in sales all the time. I, I'll use a sales example because this is where I see it in almost every organization I've ever worked with. You have a really good salesperson come in and they just start crushing it. They're closing deals, they're getting stuff done and they're a rookie salesperson. We're like, oh my gosh, look at this, Jim. This is amazing. We get time to their annual review and we say, you're amazing. We're going to give you more territory next year. You know what we're also going to do? You're going to become a sales manager. You now have a team of four salespeople reporting. Yeah, that's, to you. Right. This person, number one, isn't trained for it, doesn't have the skill set for it, doesn't want it. And now we're telling them your comp is going to not only be based on your performance, but it's going to be based on the performance of this team, thinking that that will make them work better with the team when the reality is it will make them resent the team when the team isn't pulling the levels of the comp they want to get in year two. Yeah. And now we've got this toilet bowl effect where not only is our star, who's now a manager feeling like, I don't like this job, but their resentment and their irritation about it is being transmitted to the four new people that are under them. And now we see an entire division of salespeople go down. I worked for a company years ago that when I started in February, there was a sales leader and 10 salespeople. When I left in October, let me repeat that. I started in February. When I left in October, I wasn't even there a year. There were two people left on the team, the manager and one other salesperson, nine other people, eight other people had left the team, right? I mean, it was absolutely crazy. Why? Because we promoted the wrong person. We didn't give that person the training and the support they needed. So, so I know it's gonna require more work and effort, but when we start to think more strategically about this, we build a bench for the long-term. Kirk. And, and, and it's so easy to do that, right? Everything you describe, it's so, it's so natural and easy to, to miss all those things that are necessary to help the other people really do well. And look, hey, just just to bring us in for a landing here. You, you know, I, I look around the room, and I, I I know I know some of you are remarkable people. I want to get to know the rest of you. So if you, if you reach out to me, we can hop on a call, and you never know what comes out of it. But I want to highlight John, my friend John in in Scotland. You, um, John, you're so brilliant. I, I don't even know how to describe you, but uh, you want to you want you want somebody to get clarity about you know how to build your business that's really aligned with you know, your ideal client. I mean, John is somebody to talk to. It makes me think that it'd be nice to share contact information with, with folks. I, I'm not sure, we'll figure out how to clear that, but I don't want to give away your, your private information. But, um, you know, there's, there's a handful of us here, like as intended. Um, maybe you, you could do something remarkable together. Um, you know, so so uh, l let me know if you, I'll reach out to you before I share anything, but let me know if you object to sharing contact information because I, I for the people I know John you're okay with that right yeah I mean John you have a conversation with John you'll you'll come out thinking differently right in, in, a, in a very good way and I and um I literally mean it just like Joey right working with Joey uh-huh 
Can I just jump in very, very quickly, Kurt? Because, I mean, this has been absolutely, as always, Joey, uh, fascinating, obviously. Of course, it's going to be fascinating getting you in a room. Uh, but yeah, I would have loved to have you with me this last week. Kirk knows I locked myself in a room with a client for 14 to 16 hour days, five days in a row to do business re reimagining. So basically, will, are you prepared to let me rip your business to pieces? which have been going for 10 years, do multi-million dollars, and we reimagine what it could be in every aspect, marketing, sales, HR, the whole damn thing. We got so lucky, Joe, and this is the bit why I wish you'd been there. We got so lucky because the hotel we were staying in, they decided at exactly the same time as us to, to induct over 50 new employees into their organization. On the same floor of us, in the room next to us, mm. and we we aligned our lunch breaks, our coffee breaks, so we could be in the open area foyer with everybody. So in real time, we could see how it was going, and it was so beautiful for me with the client to be able to actually show him in real terms the difference between what he thinks gets done at the top down to his people within the organization and what they're actually thinking to the point where I actually stole one of the new employee handbooks. I, oh, I actually oh, lifted oh, it. Oh. One of them had their back to the table and I thought we have to do this. And, and Joey, I'm going to share this with you later. I'm going to waste time now because everybody's got other things, but they've actually got the vision and mission statement in there. Man, could I sell you some funny stories about what, what was in there and what we actually experienced that week. So fascinating as always, Joey, in that like, it's just true what goes on out there. The, the main thing I picked up from you a, a couple of minutes ago, you said it. I think, Brian, you you actually introduced the concept and the idea. But we're always too late with stuff. We're, we're too late asking for referrals. Those referrals should have been instigated 12 months ago. We're too late. Like every aspect of what we're doing, like that one day example you gave was brilliant. Like going in on that first day and what's wrong. And, you know, the first 100 days, what's right. Should, everything should be done so much earlier. So congratulations. Love it. Yeah. Oh, thanks, John. I so appreciate that. I'll, I'll share real quickly. One of the things that has, in some ways, always shocked and amazed me, but in other ways, as a lifelong student of the human condition and how humans operate, it just reaffirms what I've always known. I have yet to meet an employer or a member of an employee team in any organization on the planet that when we look at a blank whiteboard and I say, map me the journey, from the first time an employee hears about your organization or a potential candidate hears about your organization all the way until the time when they're an advocate, I've never met a single person that can do it. Why? Because it is so disjointed. And the CEO, the leader may think, oh, we already did this. We planned it out. I've watched CEOs throw things across the room because things that they thought were happening weren't happening. Because they're like, we, we have this, we have a system, we have a process. But the reason why had never been explained to the team. They had no understanding or appreciation of we do this because X, Y, Z. They just knew we do this. Well, it's like with my children, with all due respect to my two boys, right? We sit down at the dinner table. We put our napkin on our lap. Why? so that when we drop food, it doesn't stay in our pants and shirt. Suddenly, when we start having conversations about, you get to then go help clean the pants and do the laundry thing. Shockingly, the napkin starts showing up on the lap with a lot more regularity when we understand what it is. So I appreciate you sharing that. And I look forward to hearing more about your, uh, your stories. Kirk, okay. I'll hand it back to you because I know we're getting close on our time. Okay, so here's the landing, here's the approach. So, um... Here, 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 here's kind of a quick takeaway summary, which we had more time, but here it is. Really connect with your people, understand why they're working, what they want both now and tomorrow. Align that with the purpose of the business. Like, man, we're here for a reason. And then make sure the compensation is good so they're, so they're doing well by doing good, that they're healthy. Um, and and it, if, you, if you put that all together, man, this is about people being people, making those really deep connections, doing something remarkable together, I mean, it's, it's a journey and, and that's that's worthwhile. If, if you haven't done it already, I encourage you to pick up Joey's book. I listened to it and I'm, I'm about to do some stuff different uh, starting in September because of Joey's book. Um, and I probably can go back to it a few times every six months and pick up some more. And, and, and I can tell you from firsthand experience, working with Joey is a privilege, right? Uh, just like just like John, quite frankly, and um, you know Tom's, Tom's team for technology. I mean, remarkable people. Um, 
it, for those of you I don't know, there's a handful I don't know yet. I'd love to talk to you. You know, jump on a call with me. Um, maybe something good will come out of it. Maybe with me. Definitely with Joey, something good will come. Definitely with John, something good will come. Definitely with Tom, something good will come. With me, you get a maybe. <laughs> right? And so um, love all of you. Thank you for jumping on. And, uh, you know, do some things now to make next year even better. Okay? Joey, thank you. Hey, thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining today. If I can ever be of service, don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks so much for joining us. And I wish you continued success with all your employee experiences. Take yeah. care, everyone. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, Joey. Joey. Thank you, Kirk. See, see you soon.